Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you are uh, on this planet, and welcome to the inaugural Sustainable Infrastructure Webinar Series entitled Putting Principles into Practice. I am Anna Grou from the French Research Program on Landscape and Infrastructure, ITECOP, and I'll present you the logistics of today's conference. Uh, we remind you that the session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. Uh, also, you'll have the opportunity to unmute yourself during the breakout session. Don't hesitate to use the chat function on Zoom for question or technical assistance. Clara and Sarah are here to help you. And note that the, a link uh, to this session recording will be emailed to you and available on our website. We will use a separate tool tool for polling you uh, that is called Mentimeter and I would like everybody to practice by answering our first two questions right now so please go to Mentimeter link uh, in your chat box and answer these two questions so basically this is uh, what is your profession and where are you from so we'll display the answer of this poll later on this session. Uh, I'd like now to introduce you to our first speaker of the day, who is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Losos. She's a tropical forest biologist and environmental policy analyst. She is currently senior fellow at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solution at Duke University where she and her colleagues are working on sustainable infrastructure, environmental and social policy, adaptation and resilience, and international development. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome. We are really, uh, as Anna said, so delighted to have you all joining us here today. Um, and we look forward to building a large community of practice with all of you over the next year. I want to start by briefly introducing the Sustainable Infrastructure Coalition of Learners, or SICAL, which has um, been instrumental in developing this series and, and we hope um, continuing to develop this community of learners. We spent about a half year with individuals and organizations who are interested in sustainable infrastructure and per particularly capacity development, trying to understand why more sustainable infrastructure is not being uh, adopted right now. And one of the big barriers that we found is that there is a a divide between all of the tools and standards and guidelines models that are being developed and the adoption in the field. And so really that is what this webinar is the first attempt to try and help bridge that divide. We are using a model that was actually developed uh, in the health sector by a group called Project, Project ECHO. And they were dealing with in some ways a similar issue in which there was a lot of specialized medical knowledge being developed in centers of excellence, but it wasn't getting out into rural health clinics and around the world. So they developed a model to democratize this specialized knowledge through developing virtual communities of learning that use a collaborative case-based learning, an innovative model that we are roughly basing this um, the series on and um, Project ECHO has grown rapidly in recent years. Uh, in this last year with the COVID epidemic, they have been able to, because of the urgency, been able to use this collaborative case-based method to uh, train more than a million doctors and hospital administrators and clinicians in vaccine uh, giving vaccines and doing testing and setting up models. We believe that sustainable infrastructure can use a similar model, but is also equally as urgent right now. Uh, maybe not for this year, but in the coming years, there seems to be an infrastructure boom 
And a lot of infrastructure is going to be built around the world in communities everywhere. And how this, because of the long uh, lifespan of infrastructure, how this infrastructure is built, uh, whether using sustainable practices or not, is really going to set the path for how society grows. And so we think that this is critically important. And we thank you for joining us. Now, um, this. This webinar series is our first attempt in this area uh, to build this community. We are, um, the, the, uh, the model is that every month on the second Wednesday of the month, we will have at this same time, we're gonna have a 75 minute uh, session. And the basic outline is there will be a short, we are going to base the series on 10 principles of international good practice principles developed by the UN Environment Program, UNEP. We're going to hear more about them in just a minute. Consider that as the curriculum that we will be using for the next 11 sessions. Each session will be introduced briefly to one principle. There will be a technical, short technical presentation by an expert on that some a uh, cutting edge or widely accepted tool or standard or guideline model. And then we will move to probably two um, presentations of an infrastructure system or project. It might be midstream. It will have issues related to that principle of the, of the session. And it will be a presentation by someone actually working on that infrastructure followed by an, an interactive session where other specialists or practitioners working on similar questions can um, really try and understand the complexity and try to help um, address some of the issues that that project raises. So um, you can see here that what we're trying to express is that this session is not like a similar traditional webinar session where we're passively pushing information out. The idea is really to begin to develop a community that uh, collaboratively is learning. At the end of each session, there will be an opportunity for those who wanted to get a certificate of participation. Uh, and ultimately, what we're hoping is that we will be able to spin off some smaller, more focused hubs uh, community practice hubs that might be focused on specific topics, geographies, sectors, and also we are, um, if the, uh, as this builds, we hope to be able to offer um, other types of certification for continuing education uh, or professional certifications, but that's down the road. Right now we're developing um, this community and trying to use this around UNEP's hub. So I would like to um, now turn to a couple, that's the outline. I also want to introduce there are four organizations that are supporting this. I am from, uh, they represent academia and civil society, national governments, and uh, international agencies. I am from Duke University, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. UNEP is also one of the hosts, as is Conservation International and working closely with the Green Gray Community of Practice. And then finally, uh, the French government through uh, ITACOP, and, which is uh, in the Transportation Ministry. So um, I now want to uh, just remind you that this is this webinar series. We'll get more information on this. At the end of this session, there'll be a link for signing up for the next uh, session, which is on June 9th. And we will soon have links for all of them, but uh, we're gonna hold back right now before we put all the links up there. And um, I just wanna introduce you a little bit to the people who are here today by providing some results from the, um, the Mentimeter survey you just did, the polling. 
So here, the first question was, how do you describe your profession? And you can see we have a lot of engineers here, which is terrific. <laughs> But, but uh, there are just a wide range of others. I'm seeing this for the first time myself. Um, this is terrific. And I know there's a lot of architects I noticed in the registration as well, although that doesn't um, seem to pop out as most. And then the question is, where are you from? The registration, we found that there were people registered from 45 uh, different countries. And wow, we have a lot of folks from Lebanon joining us today uh, and uh, but really all over the world really terrific so at this point I am going to turn it over to my colleague Rowan Palmer Rowan is in uh, is a program man officer management officer at UNEP based in Geneva and he works in the resources and marketing branch in Geneva where he leads the sustainable infrastructure program so thank you, Rowan, and take it away. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, good, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Good morning, good evening. Um, I am going to uh, now just give a, a brief overview of the International Good Practice Principles for Sustainable Infrastructure um, that we are sort of basing this webinar series around. So I'm just going to share my screen and I hope you all can see somebody um, tell me if you can't uh, yeah so before going into the principles themselves uh, I thought I'd just um, clarify a couple of concepts and ideas uh, that sort of how we think about infrastructure just because it may may be different than um, how some of you think about infrastructure and it's important for for understanding what we're going to talk about um so the first thing is just that when when we talk about infrastructure we're talking about infrastructure in all sectors so in addition to traditional uh infrastructure sectors like energy transport water we're also covering other sectors like housing food systems telecommunications healthcare services etc um, the second is that when we talk about infrastructure, we're not just talking about the physical assets themselves, but we're talking about the infrastructure systems. And the systems are comprised of those physical assets, the hard infrastructure, uh, you know, the roads, the buildings, the dams, the transmission lines. Um, but they also include the knowledge, the institution, and the policy frameworks in which those assets exist and that enable them to function. So the soft infrastructure. Um, and then very importantly, our discussion of infrastructure systems includes both built or gray infrastructure in all sectors, as well as natural or green infrastructure. And here we're talking about nature, about the landscapes and the ecosystems that provide many of the same services that built infrastructure can provide. And then we also have hybrid infrastructure that combines elements of the green and the gray uh, to provide services. And when we talk about sustainable infrastructure, uh, we're using, at, at least at UNEP, we're using a definition adapted from the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, which defines sustainable infrastructure as those systems that are planned, designed, constructed, operated, and decommissioned in a manner to ensure economic and financial, social, environmental and institutional sustainability over the entire infrastructure life cycle. That's pretty straightforward. I think there's three things I'd like to point out. Um, the first is that just for, for ease of talking about it, um, when I say sustainable, sustainable infrastructure sustainability, I'm kind of using it as shorthand uh, and it also includes things like resilience, you know, climate resilience and, and quality service delivery and value for money and things like that. Um, the second thing is that sustainable infrastructure um, isn't really referring to any specific type of infrastructure or a particular sector, but it's actually taught referring to the outcomes of the infrastructure development. So just because an infrastructure project might be in a a sustainable sector um, like renewable energy, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that that project is sustainable in a holistic sense. It may be low carbon, uh, 
but there may be other things like negative impacts to biodiversity or, or social impacts or other things that decrease its sustainability in the holistic sense. And then finally, when we talk about the infrastructure life cycle, we're not just talking about the life cycle of any single project or asset. This is, uh, of course, part of it, but the full infrastructure life cycle also includes things that occur upstream of any particular project. So things like the enabling institutional policy and regulatory environment, uh, the strategic planning and prioritization phases, and development of project pipelines. Um, so uh, with those sort of basic concepts in mind, um, I'll talk about the, the principles themselves now. So this is work that, that UNEP started based on a mandate from the UN Environment Assembly. Um, in the form of a rev rev resolution in 2019. And we started our implementation of this resolution with uh, a scoping of the available guidance and discourse on sustainable infrastructure. And we found three main gaps that where, where we thought we could add value. Uh, the first is that in the past, there's been a rather narrow conception of sustainability. So there's, when it comes to infrastructure, so there's a huge focus on climate and on low carbon infrastructure, but not as much on other important aspects like biodiversity or social inclusiveness. Um, the second is that sustainability is usually addressed at the project level, so often relying on safeguards connected to financing. This is, of course, really important and it's, and it's natural because projects are the unit of infrastructure development but it, it has limitations and it brings us to the third gap, which is that only looking at projects misses opportunities to incorporate sustainability in a more systemic way during those upstream phases of the life cycle. And this is really important because these upstream interventions can have benefits that cascade downstream and make it easier to address project level sustainability. And so this is where we decided to focus the efforts on addressing these gaps. And we convened an expert working group uh, of partners from our sustainable infrastructure partnership uh, to help do this. And so the results of this work are the international good practice principles for sustainable infrastructure. And these are 10 principles designed uh, to help primarily government policymakers, but, but also uh, other stakeholders as well, take needs-based systems level integrated approaches to planning and delivering sustainable infrastructure. They apply to the whole life cycle, all the way from the early strategic planning phases through design, construction, operations, and, and going to decommissioning. But there is a strong emphasis on the uh, the enabling environment and these upstream phases that occur upstream of any single project. So these principles were developed by a working group of about 30 different organizations, uh, but I would uh, like to recognize some the key contributions from, from colleagues at a few of them, uh, at the OECD, at UNOPS, at WWF, at IUCN, at the Inter-American Development Bank, and the ILO as well. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have time today to go into all of them in detail. So I'm gonna just quickly run through what the 10 principles are and then talk about uh, three kind of core ideas that, that cut across all the principles and, and sort of lie at the heart of them. So principle one is strategic planning to ensure alignment of infrastructure development with uh, sustainable development priorities. Principle two is responsive, resilient, and flexible service provision to be able to meet needs now and in the future. Principle three is comprehensive life cycle assessment of sustainability. Principle four is avoiding environmental impacts and investing in natural infrastructure, nature's ability to provide services. Principle five is resource efficiency and circularity to try and uh, minimize the resource footprint of infrastructure. Principle six is equity, inclusiveness, and empowerment by balancing investment between social and economic priorities. Principle seven is enhanced Thing, economic benefits. Principle eight 
is fiscal sustainability and innovative financing to help close the infrastructure investment gap. Principle nine is transparent, inclusive, and participatory decision making. And principle 10 is evidence based decision making. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, these, we, we characterize uh, these these principles together as forming a needs-based, a systems-level integrated approach. And so um, just to explain those three ideas a bit more, first of all, by needs-based, we mean infrastructure planning that uses data to understand the need for services and then considers how to meet those needs most effectively and sustainably using all available options. And very importantly, these options could include alternatives to building new gray infrastructure. So things like managing demand for services, rehabilitating or upgrading existing infrastructure, or investing in natural infrastructure. Uh, the second idea is this idea of systems level interventions. And this is as opposed to project level interventions. So as I mentioned before, here the emphasis is on incorporating sustainability into the enabling environment and into the strategic planning phases of the infrastructure life cycle. Uh, and the idea here is to consider sustainability as early as possible when more options are still politically, economically, and technically feasible. Once you're looking at a specific project, you've already ruled out other options and, and potentially lost opportunities for incorporating sustainability. And then finally, uh, this idea of, of integration and integrated approaches. To put it really simply, it, it just means you know, thinking beyond the project, thinking of infrastructure as a system of interconnected systems. And so this involves considering the environmental, social, and economic aspects of sustainability and, and what relationship they have with each other, considering the, the linkages between different infrastructure systems in different sectors and locations, it includes the consideration of nature as infrastructure, so accounting for the services it provides and how it interacts with built systems. And it means understanding the negative and positive impacts of infrastructure development at the cumulative level, so not looking at, at projects in isolation of others. Um, and then it also involves you know, thinking about the types of policies and governance structures and planning processes that, that are required to, to support these uh, kind of approaches. And so these, these types of needs-based systems level integrated approaches can have a number of advantages in terms of sustainable development. Number one, they result in infrastructure that's better aligned to users' needs. Um, they allow for optimization of the, the synergies and, and trade-offs between the environmental, social, and economic aspects of sustainable development. By considering nature as infrastructure, um, they can you can lead to infrastructure development that's actually strengthening nature's ability to provide services. And this can have a lot of co-benefits um, for, for nature itself, but also in terms of climate and human health and well-being. Uh, you get longer lasting infrastructure that's flexible in its delivery of services and more resilient to risks, including climate risks. And by identifying and mitigating potential risks early in planning processes, you can reduce the likelihood of conflict or opposition to projects um, by communities. So ultimately, really, we're just talking about getting better results uh, for the money, the significant amount of money that's invested in uh, infrastructure development. And just very quickly, the, these principles are complemented by uh, a couple of other um, resources. One is a collection of case studies that illustrates the principles. Uh, and the other one is a, a database of tools that uh, can be used for, by, by different stakeholders for uh, basically implementing various aspects of these principles and, and integrating sustainability throughout the various uh, stages of the life cycles. And so this, this, is, this is where I end. Those are the principles and the thinking behind them. Uh, we thought they provided a good framework to organize this webinar series around uh, and then use this case-based learning approach uh, that Liz described to explore how the various available tools um, have been used and can be used to implement different aspects of sustainable infrastructure around the world. Um, so I'll end there uh, and, and I'll ask everybody to please 
go to the Mentimeter link in the chat now, uh, where you will find another polling question. And I'll also uh, pass the floor back to Liz. What? You are muted. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Corwin. I'm the Director of Nature-Based Engineering Solutions at Conservation International. And um, as Rowan mentioned, we're moving into our second poll. And so you should see a, um, a link in the chat. Uh, and to, that'll take you to Mentimeter. If you're just joining us, um, we're using Mentimeter today to capture your, your input and thoughts um, throughout the session. So um, as Rowan wonderfully introduced, thank you Rowan um, to that introduction to the 10 principles uh, for sustainable infrastructure practice. The first question in our poll is, which of these principles are you most interested to learn about? And then we want to know why you chose those three. Um, what is it about those three that um, is particularly intriguing or you see as a gap in your field or your work or the projects um, that, you're, that you're working on to develop? So, this dot um, view is a little bit hard to see, but this is great. We already have 94 responses from those of you with us. And the ones that are really popping for me that I see are number one on strategic planning. So that'll be our first um, case-based series next month. And number four, avoiding environmental impacts has 51 votes. And then um, the next highest looks to be the number 10, evidence-based decision-making. So that's great because we've got the first one and the last one. So you guys are going to have to stick with us for the whole, the whole series throughout the year um, and learn alongside us. And then let's see some of the reasons why you chose those. Convince clients. They appear to be especially relevant from a policy perspective. I'll just read a handful of the comments that, that folks shared. Important to understand nature-based solutions. They are the most important planning is key. A strong link with sustainable public procurement. and managing infrastructure in an environmentally sustainable way. So all of the results from the Mentimeter polling will be shared um, as a part of the, the final distribution of uh, the meeting materials from today. But I'm gonna stop sharing. Please continue to answer that poll and leave your comments here. But we're gonna transition into a conversation with one of our fellow practitioners and colleagues. Um, so I'm honored today to be able to introduce and have a conversation um, with Billy Javetti. Billy is a native of Kenya and is currently stationed at the University of New Mexico School of Engineering and where he is helping with the Peace Echo Engineering Initiative. So welcome, Billy. And to get us started, Billy, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Rural Health Center in Kenya that you've been working to realize. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and a pleasure to be here. Uh, the health center you're talking about is in the background of my uh, uh, screen here. It's a vision that my mother had a dream and a vision in 1969. She was working as a community nurse aide, and there was a very high mortality rate. 
uh, in the community uh, for children and uh, expectant mothers. So uh, she wanted to have a health center that could be helping to curtail the mortality from maternal child health. Then in the year 2002, I came to the US for graduate studies. I had a burning bush moment in 2002, uh, 2009 when I met a benefactor who gave us the seed capital for this health center. We broke the ground in the year 2011. Uh, so right now the plan is to uh, build a three-story health facility and accompanying health uh, training and residential buildings, as well as supporting infrastructure that is related to water supply, electricity, and transportation around the community. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Billy. And maybe you could share with us some of the barriers for specifically environmental sustainability that you've encountered um, as you've been developing the, the health center. Oh, thank you. Quite a number uh, of those. The main one has to do with the uh, environmental impact assessments. Uh, number one is uh, when we did uh, EIA, we did lack the tools to collect the data for social and environmental sustainability. Also the cost of hiring experts to do this work. Where do we look uh, to get the data that we need? Uh, so as a result, there are several gaps in the report that we came up with as our impact assessment. Uh, the other challenge uh, or barrier has to do with the working with remote, in remote settings. I normally refer this to be as, uh, in the middle of nowhere because uh, things like electricity uh, power are frequently cut or rationed throughout the year. So we look at uh, solar uh, energy or solar power as a panacea to this. Uh, so while the upfront costs for solar panels are high, we also know that the payoff, uh, there'll be a payoff in the long run. However, the challenge is that where do we get the initial capital uh, for these investments. Secondly, we get a lot of rainfall throughout the year. Uh, there's a lot of runoff uh, from the road when we are doing the improvement. So where do we, how are we able to avoid runoff getting into people's farms? And then ultimately is uh, addressing these issues. Where do you start? Has always been a barrier. Great, thank you, Billy. And the last question for you is from the social perspective, what have your interactions been like with the community and um, local governments as you've been developing the project? I would say uh, the community has been uh, ecstatic uh, seeing this pro uh, project come along. The community is so uh, engaged. However, at the government level, uh, there are so many issues that I'm dealing with. Uh, the main one uh, stems from the lack of support from the local government. Most of them are political appointees or elected. Uh, the mere fact that I've been able to come this far without uh, con getting some of the political donations has also been one of the reasons we have taken, uh, not been able to enlist their support. Uh, related to that is the funding shortfalls for some of the programs we intend to implement uh, for jobs training. There's also gender issues related to the culture of the region where we live in. And then we also uh, experience lack of training uh, to build skilled healthcare workers in the region. Our country, uh, Kenya, faces an acute shortage of uh, healthcare workers. And being in the rural areas, this is a major issue. However, I want just to explain, uh, provide an example of one of the overarching uh, complex, you know, uh, uh, issues that we have had to deal with. Uh, this has to do with um, where we are located. When we began in 2011, uh, the construction of the health facility, we did not envision uh, something like water conflicts. Uh, being a major issue to deal with. Uh, right now, uh, we are having to deal with a water conflict because our main supply for construction and uh, servicing the health center 
is now putting us into a conflict, you know, with the schools in the region, uh, with the community that also comes here to draw domestic water. And of course, the small scale uh, gold miners that are also coming here to excavate and filter uh, the soil and causing a lot of environmental health hazards. This in itself is one of the issues that we are dealing with currently. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much, Billy. I just want to thank you not only for joining us for today, but um, your kind of persistence and, and patience to realize this project and do it in a sustainable way. Um, so just want to applaud you for that. And I am imagining that many of the issues that Billy just mentioned around environmental impact assessments and coordinating with local communities and governments and water issues, energy sustainability resonate with many of the people that are joining us today. Um, so with that, I wanna transition to our next poll. Um, so back at the, the Mentimeter, um, we have a question for you about what you see as the real and perceived barriers to achieving sustainable infrastructure outcomes. And it, while we have this poll open, we're gonna give you a chance to have breakout rooms and meet with um, four or five different colleagues uh, from around the world who are working um, on developing or researching sustainable infrastructure projects. So the breakout rooms will be open for about seven minutes. So please take a moment, um, introduce e yourselves um, to each other. And then as a, as a conversation starter, um, this question about um, barriers to implementing sustainable infrastructure um, is kind of the topic of conversation. So um, with that, we'll see you back here in about seven minutes. Welcome back. Hope you had a chance to meet some new people, <laughs> get some new perspectives on sustainable infrastructure development. Um, so just as a reminder, we're, you know, well, we're too big of a group, unfortunately, to have a, a small dialogue and op open it up for conversation. Um, so in lieu of that, we're using Mentimeter to capture some of our observations from the conservation, from the conversation. So I'm sharing my screen here with some of the, the inputs that have been input so far from about 53 of you. And this is to the question that was put to you in your groups about the real and perceived barriers to achieving sustainable infrastructure outcomes. So ones that I'm seeing here come up a lot are, I would say, funding, financing, political issues, lack of knowledge and not clear incentives, insufficient data, capacity limitations, insufficient standards. So there's obviously quite a few that we're all grappling with. And we're curious now on this next question, what you see as the most significant of these. And of course, we haven't, we don't have all the options here, um, but the the ones that we've pulled out are around education and training, funding, kind of lack of confidence, clarity of definition, what does sustainable infrastructure mean or look like, governance or political leadership, cultural, and then barriers around permits or approvals. So kind of getting to the environmental impact assessment um, type issues that, that Billy raised. So I'll give you all a moment to navigate to Mentimeter and fill out this poll. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to do that. And it seems as though funding and governance and political leadership are um, two of the key aspects. So thank you for, for taking the time to do that and continue to answer this. Um, so, 
Next, um, we have another interview or conversation that we want to share with you. And this is a pre-recorded conversation that I had um, a couple nights ago with a, a colleague in the Philippines, Josie Deasis. Um, and we had to cut or trim the interview just for time, um, but the full recorded interview will be available on the webinar series website um, after this meeting. And in the clip you're about to see, she mentions um, three aspects of projects, project development, uh, the economic, environmental, and social. So just have that in your mind um, as we transition into um, that conversation that I was able to have with her. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Josie De Assis. So uh, primarily, I work as a faculty member in the architecture department of the Technological Institute of the Philippines, Manila. Uh, and then aside from that, uh, I also work as a uh, junior consultant together with a team of environmental planners. So uh, we usually go into uh, helping local government units craft their uh, comprehensive land use and development plans. And uh, as a as a faculty member, um, maybe because of my, my background and what I do, um, I often handle planning courses. And uh, one, of the, one of the courses that I handle is Urban Design Studio. Uh, and uh, in Urban Design Studio, what we usually do together with our students is we look at existing communities, we look at urban areas. And uh, while looking at that, we try to do a survey of what uh, infrastructure and spaces that they have in that area. And then from that survey, we also look at um, the activities of the people, the needs of the community, um, some observable issues and so on. Uh, and the end result of that is that um, the students uh, should be able to come up with uh, proposed solutions to make the community or the area more robust, more responsive to the needs of the community. Is what skills or tools or educational resources would be valuable to your work and the, the work with students kind of thinking about this next generation of engineers and architects designing um, yeah. and implementing sustainable infrastructure solutions? Um, what would be helpful from your perspective to make more projects possible like the ones you just described? Yeah, uh, well, skills wise, um, again, skills wise and, and capacity wise, uh, I, I strongly believe in the skills and capacity of our uh, engineers, scientists, our planners, our design professionals, and so on. That I, I really do not think that there is uh, much lacking uh, in, in terms of that aspect. Um, but uh, well, in terms of in terms of education uh, on on how we can bring this about and so on. Um, however, uh, there is one aspect that I would uh, I think we should look into uh, and that is the sort of buy-in from from non-technical people that's uh, that's something that we really have to look into so um non-technical people or buy buy-in from them so like for from decision makers from uh, such as politicians or lawmakers and so on our businessmen and and the community themselves as a whole um so uh going back again to to the examples that that i mentioned earlier um this idea of sustainable infrastructure the idea of sustainable development all of these things um this has to be packaged in a way that um that it seems as if or not really as it seems um it has to be packaged in a way that it will benefit again all of those aspects uh because uh again going back to to the examples that i have uh, stated earlier um that one works well because it covers all all three aspects in it so again that that particular buy-in is is very important so um uh unfortunately uh, i i this is something that i have to mention uh but um uh, when when I talk about this buy-in and and sometimes I also mention this to to my students um sometimes um we have to find a way to package the idea uh, in a way that um, you will be able to sh to share really how much it can benefit anyone or yeah. well all of those three aspects and sometimes the benefit has to be converted into monetary aspect so uh, uh, because that's that's how you get the buy-in so you need to, to tell them oh you're gonna get this much savings you're gonna get uh, this much income from this one uh, and when you are able to 
to do that, then they get to see, oh, that that's something that that's something that we can really look into. So I think that that's something that we have to look we have to look into, um, because um, that's one I think one downside or one issue that we are we are facing. So a lot of this uh, infrastructure that are again really good, really interesting, will really help us a lot. Um, a lot of this are not mainstream. Mostly because, uh, well, one thing because of high initial uh, outlay, uh, yeah. and the second is because of the uh, time frame that it takes to set up everything. Yeah. So again, from political perspective, uh, the person that will set it up, chances are they are not in charge uh, for for the duration of the setup or the implementation. So they, it's really difficult for them to see the benefit of that one. Uh, and for of course for business people, um, it's a bit difficult or uh, it's it's better if we can we can show them that yes it has an initial it has a high uh, cost outlay but um it will it will you will have a return of investment so that's something that at least we have to learn how to package it that way um because again design professionals wise i think everyone is really into this one everyone is yeah. is uh, agreeing that we should be going towards <laughs> yeah. this direction um, for for design professionals for the uh, for uh, for those dealing with environmental protection. I think it's just that we have to package it in a way that it it will uh, we will see the benefit of this in terms of the economy. Thank you so much. That is um, really well said, and I think you're joined with professionals and colleagues around the world, and you're um, kind of positive vision for the future and the potential for innovation of sustainable infrastructure solutions. So great. Um, and I'm just struck with two of the points that that Josie raises in her um, in our conversation about some of the biggest barriers are the two biggest ones that you all have identified in the Mentimeter um, here around um, funding and that kind of governance and political leadership and kind of tenure of some of our political leader, leaders and how that overlaps or not with the project implementation timeframe. So um, we have, we're coming close to the end of our time, but we want to give you another chance to connect with, with colleagues. And so we're going to open up those breakout rooms and the, the same, you'll meet with the same group of people again. And the prompt for this, this conversation is what would be most helpful to you to realize sustainable infrastructure development in your work? And um, I also welcome you to, um, you know, obviously deviate from this question, but also be able to um, save some time at the end to, to say goodbye and maybe exchange um, information about how to connect afterwards. So we'll have these breakout rooms open for um, about five or six minutes, um, and then we'll come back. And please um, go ahead and, and input any reflections that you have into the Mentimeter um, so we can see those when we return. Um, so see you back here in about five or six minutes. Welcome back. It's it feels so special and amazing to meet <laughs> new people in these this era of pandemic and spending lots of time at home. So I hope you also were kind of hardened by um, having the opportunity to to swap stories and perspectives um, with a new colleague or two. So um, the last Mentimeter here, your reflections from the breakout room. Um, we'll paste the link one more time into the chat. And please continue to add your comments um, and input throughout the survey. And um, particularly on this question, what would be most helpful to you to realize sustainable infrastructure development in your work? And um, what skills, tools, or educational opportunities are needed most to realize more sustainable infrastructure projects? Um, so I, and then while we have our last um, handful of minutes here, continue to move through the Mentimeter and we have some kind of post um, meeting survey 
questions for you. And because this is a series, please, if you can take this extra time now to complete this, we'd really appreciate it because it'll help inform how we design um, the subsequent sessions. So with that, I will pass it back to Liz to close us out and just want to thank you all again very much for your work and your time um, and interest in this topic. So be well. Thank you, Emily. That was great. And um, I, we're delighted to see so many people have stuck with us to the end. I just am going to um, finish this off by saying thank you for joining us. We hope to see you on June 9th for our first session, which will focus on strategic planning. And uh, I think we're going to put a link to the registration uh, now. But of course, you can go to our website as well. We will be sending an email afterwards with a link to this recording. Feel free to share it with others. Um, and we will also be sharing with that all of those um, links that we've mentioned to things like the principles, the 10 good practice principles and the Navigator website and all the different links. Additionally, if you don't have a chance to do the post session survey now. We really hope you will do it. Uh, we'll send you a link to that survey as well. So, uh, oh, final thing is if you have any questions of us or suggestions, or you know of a great, say, um, case study that would be really valuable for us to use in later sessions, feel free to respond to the email. Sarah Mason, who is behind all this, um, and uh, you can reach out to us through that. A thank you, especially, of course, to Emily and Rowan, but also to Anna, who you met in the beginning, and Sarah Mason. And you've also seen Claire just typing away on the side, and also uh, Joseph Price from UNEP. Everyone has been terrific, and we look forward to seeing you every month for the next 11 months. So thanks so much. See you in June.